uh, thank you. And dear sisters and brothers, as has become our tradition, um, the Archbishop of Canterbury and I are sharing this address, so I'm going first. Uh, I hate this coronavirus. I hate it not only because so many people have died, but because so many people have died alone, unable even to hold the hand of their beloved. I hate it because our health service has been stretched to the limit. I hate it because so many are bereaved and could not even sit next to their family at the funeral or embrace each other. I hate it because weddings and baptisms and ordinations have been postponed or have gone ahead without the parties that were meant to be with them. I hate it because children's schooling has been disrupted. I hate it because so many people are ill, so many crying out in pain, so many isolated, lonely, fearful, depressed. I hate it because behind locked doors, terrible things have happened. I hate it because the poor and disadvantaged have been hit the hardest. I hate it because it has left so many people across the world feeling hopeless, as if life itself has been taken from us. I hate this coronavirus. And I reluctantly acknowledge that because of this coronavirus, we have learned some hard lessons about ourselves. We have learned that we belong to each other, that my interest is tied up with your interest. We have learned again that death is real. We have learned that progress doesn't mean living in a pain-free world. We have learned that those whose jobs we thought of as menial or inconsequential are vital and essential. We have learned that at the moment the best way to love one another is to keep a distance. And we have learned that love transcends boundaries and happily can easily jump two meters. And in the church we have learned that even without the much grieved for assurance of sacrament and congregation and all the other happy familiarities of worship, Christ is with us, with us as he has always been, present in the midst of endeavor, suffering and ministry. We have learned that the local church is the center and that pastoral care and all sorts of worship, old and new, can go on in old and new ways, and that loving your neighbor is, after all, what it's all about. And I reluctantly acknowledge that although there is nothing good about COVID-19, good can come out of it if we respect and love each other and learn how to inhabit the world differently so that the spread of the virus can be kept under control. We, the Church of Jesus Christ, have an opportunity to take the lead in this, speaking out for the poor, making sure that the restrictions we live by are administered fairly and work for the common good, and by making sure that other things like the curse of racism, the way we inhabit the planet, and our relationships with each other within the United Kingdom and Europe do not slip from the agenda. Therefore, despite all this, I am thankful. I am thankful for the faithfulness and hard work and ingenuity of those who serve in our health, emergency, and essential services. I am thankful for those in public office who have made hard decisions, inevitably come in for sharp criticism, but who continue to give themselves to serve us and keep us safe. 
I am thankful for the witness and service of the local church in our parishes, chaplaincies, and other various expressions of church life, for people's creativity and tenacity, especially in care for the vulnerable and in sustaining the life of worship. I am thankful for those in the national church who have sought to interpret government advice and guide the church through these difficult times. I am thankful that despite all the horrors of a COVID world, we are learning a new commitment to Christ and how to be a humbler, simpler church, that we are putting Christ at the center of our lives and learning very, very painfully what it really means to be a church that is dependent on Christ alone. And I am filled with longing. I long for us to find ways of affirming and thanking all the people who work for us and with us. And I long for us to find our voice in the building of a better world. And I long for us to be a more Christ-centered and Jesus-shaped church, witnessing to Christ and bringing the healing balm of the gospel to our nation. For this is our vocation. Synod, I hate this coronavirus. Nevertheless, I reluctantly acknowledge that there are important things for us to learn. I am thankful for the good things that have emerged, not least our dependence on each other and on God, and I long for us to share this more effectively in the world. Finally, I am sorry for the inevitable mistakes we have made along the way. But confident in God's mercy and of your own forbearance, I invite us now, even in this strange synod, to do no other than boldly and humbly share the gospel in deed and word across the life of our nation. Therefore, I cry out and invite you to cry out with me. Death, where is your sting? Grave, where is your victory? For I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Thank you, Archbishop Stephen. And it's a great pleasure to be able to use that title. I had forgotten that since the 12th century, it has been the tradition in the Church of England that after the Archbishop of York has spoken, if the Archbishop of Canterbury speaks next, you have to disinfect the lectern. <laughs> Thank you, Synod, for being here today. Thank you for those of you who've made the journey, who've made the effort, and have shown your commitment. Thank you. But we meet together as we face a new time of trial, the second wave. We go into it knowing the fragility of those who can be struck down. We fear the loss of those we love. We see how an economy can be brought to its knees by a virus and that all the economists in the world do not have an answer. 
We hear with great shame of the growth in food bank demand, in abuse and domestic violence, in the growth of poverty, and many of our churches have experienced it themselves. We do not know what kind of Church of England will emerge from this time, except that it will be different. It will be changed by the reality that for the first time, all churches have closed. First time in 800 years. It will be changed because for the first time, we have worshipped virtually. We do not know what kind of country will emerge. We see good things, courage, in the NHS, in the essential services, in the key workers. As Archbishop Stephen said, the most humble, the most overlooked, and the most forgotten, giving everything. We see faithfulness to neighbour. We see communities pulling together for the common good. We see new life being found across our nation. But we also see bad things. We see self-interest seeking. We see divisions deepening. Other crises, crises of racism, of the economy, especially for the smaller businesses who employ so many, of hunger amongst children as well as adults, of the dangers of mass unemployment with all the mental ill health, with all the peril to families and hopes that that brings. We see children who have missed out on much of the education they need. We see the tragedies of bereavement, the pains of long-term illness, whether COVID or not, made more severe by the pandemic. We see people crippled by mental health issues made more desperate through isolation. And as well as the good and the bad, we see uncertainties, especially at this moment around Europe. For some, the promise of Brexit twice voted for may be welcomed, for others regretted, but it remains, the consequence of it remain uncertain. We are aware of questions about the very union of our United Kingdom. And we will face that head on in the next 12 months as we come to the elections next May. We continue most of all and most savagely dangerously for all our futures to prevaricate over the reality of the crisis in the environment. Uncertainty is all around us. A pandemic that has been there since the crisis in 2008-9, created in that crisis, accentuated by austerity, and it has led to divisions which in the last few years have left, left us with uncertainty fatigue, which leads us to a rush to hasty decisions often wrong. I want to echo what Archbishop Stephen said and apologize where we have gone wrong, perhaps through that uncertainty fatigue. It may make us, the uncertainty, afraid of our newly realized fragilities. Personally, in society, in the economy, in the nation, in the church. In one sense, it has given us a sort of national PTSD. Yet, the Church of England is not first and foremost an institution or an organization. One might say slightly cynically, it's never shown any danger of becoming an organization. <laughs> we are not our own to squabble over and seek to dominate. We are one small part of God's own people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, called by God to declare the wonderful works of the one who called us out of darkness into God's marvelous light. We are a people of faith and hope. 
There's Isaiah says to Ahaz in Isaiah chapter 7 verse 9, if you do not stand in faith, you will not stand at all. In this nation and around the world, this is a time of trauma, of loss and bereavement and struggle. Yet amidst it all, the darkness does not overcome the light. We are here to bear witness to the light, for in so doing, our faith bears witness to our hope within. We bring resilience, give courage, share mercy. We will bless our nation. Out of these times, we will see renewal. Not because we're clever, but because God is faithful. We will see a renewed and changed church emerging from the shocks of lockdown. It is a church that at the most local has fed so many, been in touch with the isolated through the heroic efforts of all who take part in it, of clergy and laity and those who even weren't near the church before these times. It is a church which has continued to pray and to offer worship through our Lord Jesus Christ, even if in new and unusual ways. I think I'm on mute ways. We all know that. It's become a liturgical greeting. <laughs> I think you're on mute. How much we give thanks for this church, don't we? It has loved and served children in schools. It has loved and served the homeless on the streets. And as it has done so, Jesus has been at work among us. In the last few months, we found the joy of meeting together again to worship and pray even without music. We've seen so many come forward for training as ordinance. We've seen buildings that could not be used for worship, used for food banks. We've seen chaplains in hospitals standing shoulder to shoulder and strengthening the weary members of the NHS and being strengthened by them. We've seen God's order bringing spirit at work among us and among others. We have seen the providence of God. Today is a day of seeming formality. With this chair, definite formality. Yet we meet as God's people, not our own we meet with the light whom no darkness can quench, the word whom no clamour can still, filled, please God, with hope that makes sense because of God. We meet to debate and hopefully to pass a measure. Yet above all, we meet with Jesus Christ. And in our ponderings, we may to begin to discern the church that God is causing is caressing, is loving into emerging from these times. Renewed in faith, infused with hope, compelled by love to serve and to bless the communities, the very nation that we pray will rise renewed from these times.